Today we're out in the fog taking a look at the 2020 swan song edition of the Chevy Bolt. I'm of course kidding about the swan song part. That's not what Chevy is calling this, but we already know that there's going to be a 2021 refresh coming soon that's going to get a lot of significant changes. Now some folks out there have seen the new 2021 Bolt, but there are no public photos out there, but we know a lot about what's going to be in that new model and we're of course going to talk about that here. The first thing that's going to change for 2021 is a new front end look. We're told to expect something a little bit more expressive and certainly a bit more modern. The current generation Bolt was definitely styled an awful lot like the previous generation Volt. There are a lot of headwinds right now in the EV segment. Obviously, Tesla is sucking the air out of the room with their latest EV models, the Model 3 and the Model Y. And then also a factor in this segment is that General Motors has essentially run out of tax credits. If you bought your car after March 31st, 2020, there is no federal tax credit available on the Chevy Bolt. That's because General Motors sold so many Chevy Volts, the one with the V, not the B1, which is the full electric. That's part of why the Volt has now been canceled, and it's also why the Bolt is getting a significant refresh in 2021, but they didn't wait until 2021 to already tweak the Bolt here, so we get some upgrades for 2020. The biggest of which is a range increase. This is now EPA rated for nearly 260 miles of range. 2021 and 2022 are also supposed to bring us a number of other full EVs from the General Motors suite of companies, so expect the Bolt to be nestled into that segment at the bottom end of things. This is a subcompact hatchback, so definitely keep that in mind as we look around. This again looks an awful lot like the previous generation Volt here. We have this sort of shield thing going on up front, a lot of blacked out sections right here because we don't need a lot of cooling in a full battery electric vehicle. We have turn signals down here below the headlamps, and these are HID headlamps, not LEDs. Although this is essentially a fully loaded bolt and we do have that 360 degree camera system and a number of other active safety features, GM has been a little bit slow to roll out things like adaptive cruise control across their lineup. That's something that we've noted in their pickup truck line and also the bolt. Now that's going to change for 2021 because it is going to get a camera based adaptive cruise control system. I was a little bit curious as to how that system would really function in real world driving, but it works pretty well. You can actually find that system on dealer lots right now in the Chevy Trailblazer and the Buick Encore GX. It uses a single camera, not a stereo camera setup like we find in Subaru models, but it seemed to work just fine. Now the 2020 Bolt does have autonomous emergency braking and collision warning. We just don't have that next level in adaptive cruise control functionality. There is a 360 degree camera available and they've nestled that camera right there above the lower section of the grille. There are a decent number of people out there that think the front end design of the Bolt is a little bit frumpy, but I think that it's the side profile that is perhaps more controversial. It's not just the shape, but also the styling that goes on on the side. Remember that the Bolt is a subcompact vehicle, however. This is a subcompact hatchback. It's 164 inches long, which means this is shorter than a Volkswagen Golf and about the same overall length as a Hyundai Kona EV. This is about 8 inches shorter than a Kia Niro and 20 inches shorter than a Tesla Model 3. When designing the Bolt, General Motors knew that their federal tax credits would likely expire well into the life cycle of the Bolt, and indeed, the tax credits have expired before the Bolt even gets a refresh. So it was certainly important for General Motors to make the Bolt as inexpensive as possible and as close to profitable as possible as well. That's likely why the Bolt is the size that it is and it's built the way that it is as well. On the other hand, other car companies out there have decided that in order to make things profitable, they have to go in the opposite direction and make much more expensive EVs. Now, on the right side for the Bolt, this is one of the least expensive EVs available in America, and there's a serious amount of cash on the hood right now, up to $10,000 off depending on the area of the country that you live in, because again, there's no federal tax credit. But the Bolt has an awful lot going on for it when it comes to the engineering, and we'll talk about that later. I think the coolest design element on the Bolt has to be these tail lamp modules. There's a lot going on there, and there are these really eccentric squiggles that make this very distinctive when you're following a Bolt on the road. The tail lamp modules are also part of the hatch only. They don't extend onto the body, and that helps the Bolt look a little bit wider than it really is. You'll also notice that very much like Audi and the Lincoln Corsair, we have a separate module right down here that turns on when the hatch is open. That's required by federal law because you're not supposed to have tail lamp modules on movable parts of the body. The way to get around that is to have a second tail lamp module right down there. So these will function as the brake lights and as the parking lights when the hatch is opened. And then we always have the turn signals right there inboard. The lights on the hatch are LEDs, but the lights down here are incandescent. As with any EV, a lot of folks have questions about battery life and range. One important thing to know about the Bolt is that at least for 2020, there's no heat pump available. So the cabin is heated via a resistive element heater. 
heating the cabin that way is not going to be as efficient as using a heat pump, and that's why we see a lot of modern EVs moving over to heat pumps, including Tesla with the all-new Model Y. Even in sub-freezing weather, a heat pump is always going to be more efficient to heat the cabin in your EV. Unfortunately, they're more expensive than a resist development heater, and that's why we don't find them in less expensive EVs, generally speaking. That means that as we see in, for instance, a Tesla Model 3 and other EVs that don't use a heat pump, in colder weather, you're going to notice your range dropping a little bit faster in something like this versus some of the options that have optional heat pumps or standard heat pumps. So that's definitely a factor to keep in mind if you're considering an EV and you live in one of those colder climates. General Motors has traditionally been a pretty conservative company when it comes to drivetrain design, and that applies to the battery pack in the Bolt as well. Like the Volt before it, this is an active temperature controlled battery pack. It's liquid cooled. The vehicle can also heat the battery pack when needed. Although the battery in the Bolt and the Volt are not the same and they don't use exactly the same kind of cooling and heating mechanism, clearly the research and development that went into the Volt has helped inform the research and development for this guy. And that's why, as far as predicted reliability goes, I would put this up there with the Tesla battery packs and other more expensive battery packs, and definitely a step ahead of air-cooled battery packs like we find, for instance, in the Nissan LEAF or the first-generation Kia Soul. When Chevrolet was designing and launching the Bolt, the competitive EV landscape was quite different. This was clearly designed to compete with something like a Nissan LEAF. Even today, as long as we're talking about EVs outside the luxury segment, the Bolt stacks up pretty well with 200 horsepower and 266 pound-feet of torque. It also stacks up pretty well when it comes to range, because 2020 brings us a bump in range and bump in battery capacity. We have 66 kilowatt hours usable to the driver, and that gives us 259 miles up from 238 for 2019. The charging figures remain the same as 2019, but they have tweaked things around the edge. So we have a 7.2 kilowatt onboard charger. Charge port is right over here on the driver's side on the front of the vehicle. And there's still the option to charge at a DC fast charge station using the CCS standard at 50 kilowatts. Now for 2021, we're going to get the ability to go up to 100 kilowatts at a DC fast charge station. However, this vehicle for 2020 already receives a bit of a tweak, allowing it to stay at 50 kilowatts for longer than a 2019 model year vehicle. So even though the max charge rate for 2020 is still 50 kilowatts, supposedly this will get you from zero to 80% a little bit faster than before. However, it does mean that for 2020, this is going to be slower charging than the Hyundai Kona EV, which gives you almost identical range, one mile range less than this, and will charge at 75 kilowatts. Well, we have the hood open. Let's talk about one of the questions I get asked very, very frequently. Why don't more electric cars have front trunks or frunks? Something that obviously Tesla has helped popularize, but something that has existed in gasoline rear engine vehicles for quite some time. Now, in a gasoline rear wheel drive vehicle, that's the most logical place to put your trunk because what would normally be the trunk is occupied by an engine, say in something like a Porsche 911. Meanwhile, in electric vehicles that were designed to be front wheel drive cars, Logically, the motor and a lot of the related control systems end up under the hood, and that's why we just don't have room for a front. The other thing to keep in mind is that there are some cars out there. This applies a little bit less to the Bolt, which was designed as an EV from the start. This applies a little bit more to things like the Kona, the Nero, the Mini Electric, etc. Remember that the engine provides some portion of the crash structure. That's why we have some EVs out there like the Mini Electric, which has a whole bunch of tubes and bars circling the electric motor. That allows the electric motor to be about the same size and shape and transmit the same kind of loads that you would normally expect to be in the gasoline version so the crash structures all function the same. Now that's not to say that you could not design a vehicle like this from the ground up with an electric motor in the back and a frunk up front, but there is some debate as to whether or not that would be more cargo practical than what we find in the Bolt. If you were to put this arrangement in the back and then put a cargo area up front, you may not necessarily end up with more storage space. You may have to have a slightly higher load floor in the back, and then you'd have your cargo area split between the back and the front. And lastly, some of this ends up being a styling choice, because clearly if they gave us a longer front end, like we would find in a Model 3 or a Model Y or the Ford Mach-E, then we would be able to have a bit of a front trunk. Or you could go the Volvo direction where they've deliberately tried to move some of the things from under the hood to elsewhere in the vehicle so they could give you a teeny tiny front trunk in the upcoming XC40 full electric vehicle, the usefulness of which I'm not exactly clear on yet. In my opinion, more storage is always better, so I love the idea of the frunk. I also love vehicles where they've been able to give us a frunk and not really sacrifice a lot with the rest of the vehicle. Tesla is obviously the standard bearer for that, but we are seeing more and more frunk designs in new EVs that were designed ground up to be electric vehicles, especially more performance-oriented, bigger EVs than the Bolt. Remember, the Bolt is a subcompact vehicle. There's not a whole lot of space going on here, so there really wouldn't be anywhere to put a front trunk. But you could expect if General Motors was to make a midsize or larger sedan or crossover, they could very logically incorporate a front trunk into those designs 
if they really wanted to. Something that hasn't been addressed for 2020, but we're told will be for 2021, is the driver's seat comfort. I find the driving position pretty good. We're sitting in a more upright position than generally you'd find in a subcompact hatchback, because this feels a little bit more crossover or SUV-like, I suppose. But the seat itself is not terribly comfortable for my body size. I'm six feet tall, and I find that the seat back especially has no lumbar support for me, and the shoulder area is pretty constricted, so it feels sort of like I'm curled up into a little ball right there because of the way the seat is shaped. There's also no power seat available in the Bolt at any price at the moment. We get a tilt telescopic steering column with a small range of motion. You can see it doesn't really telescope very much right there. And the passenger seat obviously is a manual seat as well. On the other hand, General Motors did an excellent job with the back seats. We have 78.1 inches of combined legroom in here. Oddly enough, that's about the same kind of legroom that you find in the Model S. That's possible because of the profile of the Bolt. This is obviously more upright than the Model S, which is a stretched out sedan. Now, it's not going to be as wide as the Model S. We're just talking about combined legroom here, front row plus second row. And that's why I still have about six inches of legroom back here. And it's why people have noted that you can definitely fit a rear facing child seat in the Bolt if you wanted to. We also have a completely flat floor that's made possible by the skateboard style battery pack that we find under there. That means that a middle passenger is going to be probably a little bit more comfortable than in the average subcompact. I still have a reasonable amount of headroom here. If I lean all the way back, my head does touch the ceiling, but if I'm sitting in a more normal position, my hair is just brushing there inboard. The center seat position is a little higher off the ground than the outboard sitting positions. So if I move over here to the right side, I can put my head back there against that headrest. My head is just touching the ceiling. Now we do have a little bit of a crown to the roof over here. So if you try and put your head to the side, it may touch, but overall room in the back is pretty decent. And I do like the fact that GM didn't slam these seat bottom cushions all the way to the floor. They do give you a little bit more thigh support for adults. Rear seat passengers get a fold down center armrest of two cup holders, and then there are two USB charge only ports in the center console. One of the ways that Chevy gets to that really impressive combined legroom score is by giving us pretty thin front seat backs, but unfortunately that does help contribute to the front seat comfort score. Bearing in mind that the Bolt is not a terribly big vehicle, we find not a terribly big cargo area back here. This is just under 17 cubic feet. Now I was able to get four of our 24 inch roller bags back here because it's a pretty deep cargo area, but this is not as big as the cargo areas that you'll find in larger EVs quite logically. And those larger EVs aren't necessarily gonna be that much more expensive than the Bolt. You'll certainly find a larger and squarer cargo area in the back of something like the upcoming Soul EV if it ever manages to find its way to the US. We're still waiting on that 2020 Soul EV. And logically, you're gonna get more cargo area in something like a Tesla Model Y, but the Model Y is gonna be significantly more expensive. In our 24 inch roller bag test, we were still able to get four of those bags back here because of the really deep cargo area. The depth of the cargo area allows 22 inch roller bags to be in this upright position and still be completely below the cargo cover. And if I pull that out and grab the cargo area load floor, you'll notice that it slots right in here to make the load floor even with the hatch. Going further down the rabbit hole, we have a little area which looks like it could accommodate a compact spare tire, but upon closer inspection, it's not really round enough, so I don't think one would fit. This is where we find the tow hook, the storage area for the fix-a-flat kit, tire iron, that sort of thing. As we look around the interior, keep in mind that we are in a Premier trim with an MSRP of about $43,000. You'll notice that we don't have a moonroof right up there. And if we move over to the side, you can see what I was talking about earlier, about the ceiling having sort of a crown right there. This reminds me a little bit of the Honda Fit and the Honda HRV. We also see it right back there in that rear passenger area. The driver and front passenger have fixed height shoulder belts and two way adjustable headrests. The upholstery has an interesting asymmetric design to it. So you can see that the outer section of the seat is this light gray over there. And then on the inboard side, it's this darker gray. We have some orange stitching there to help dress things up. The seats are perforated, but they're not ventilated. Bolstering is pretty minimal on the side cushion and almost non-existent on the seat bottom cushion. So larger folks shouldn't have any trouble sitting in here. And you'll notice that same asymmetrical design on the seat bottom cushion. Most of the interior components, the doors and the dashboard are made from mainly hard plastics. Hard plastics are lighter and they're generally a little bit more durable than soft plastics, but on the downside, they don't feel quite as premium. They also generally are a little bit less expensive to make. All that together is why we generally find harder plastics in a lot of EVs out there. We find a large bottle holder down there at the bottom of the door and some themed accent inserts right there. The trim on the dashboard and doors has sort of an interesting geometric pattern there. It also looks woven in a way from certain different angles and reminds me a little bit of house wrap. Let me know if you know what I'm talking about down there in the comments section. That goes from the doors on over to the dashboard. You notice that we have a small window right there in front of the front doors. And then we have this really long sloping windshield. 
The upper portion of the dashboard is not a soft touch injection molded plastic, it's a hard plastic that's then had sort of a rubbery coating applied to keep it from reflecting as much and also feel a little bit more premium. We then have this white accent strip that runs from one side all the way to the other. Two large air vents right there in the middle and a pretty big infotainment screen. When the Bolt launched, this was absolutely enormous, and even today, this is still one of the larger infotainment screens you'll find there in a new car. The software is quite different from what we see in other GM models. This is obviously very EV focused. We have a lot of charging options in here. You can see where the power is going, just like you'd expect in a modern EV. But I like this information screen because it allows you to really drill down into what your power is going towards. Climate, for instance, battery conditioning, driving, and accessories right there. And you can also see what's impacting your range. Technique, terrain, that's obviously a big factor where I live, climate settings, out outside temperature, etc. And that has resulted in a loss of range of about 12 miles, apparently. And then of course we have our efficiency average right there. One thing that GM does really well is give you a lot of information about what the EV drivetrain is up to and what to expect out of range and out of the battery. That's really one of the big things that I've noticed in the Bolt and that continues for 2020. We have some physical buttons for that infotainment system right here, the controls for the single zone automatic climate control right there, little sport button, and then the hazard light button right over there. Below that, we have the benefit of having a completely flat floor. So that's a big storage area right there, right on the floor. You could definitely put a gallon of milk in there. I had one there earlier when I went to the grocery store. Two large cup holders right here. And then basically the same joystick shifter we find in some Buicks. There's an unlock button on the side. Drive is down there. Low is one toggle beyond. If you want reverse, we press the unlock button, go all the way forward and then over to the left. Park is the button on top. There's an electric parking brake button right there. We find two USB inputs for that infotainment system and then a slot where you can put your smartphone. But if you have a larger smartphone, you can't use the rubber insert that's included with the vehicle. You do have to remove it. It doesn't look quite as finished without that little rubber insert in place. Remembering that the bolt itself is not terribly wide, the center console is pretty narrow. If we open that up, we find a small storage area, just about wide enough for some of those larger smartphones, but it is pretty darn deep. On the driver's side, we have a fairly small LCD instrument cluster. This has a few different available themes. So we can click over here using the buttons on the steering wheel, choose layout, and then we can choose from a classic layout, a modern layout, or the enhanced layout that we were on before. I like the enhanced layout because it gives us a little bit more information about what's going on, including how much power exactly is going into or out of the battery right there. Regen state down there below. And then on the left side, I think is a really great display. It says that it's estimating that we have 161 miles of range, but if we drive this gently, maybe we could get 218. And if we don't, maybe we'd be down there at 132. I love the way that General Motors is giving us a realistic range for the range because that's just how the real world works. In a real world situation, 161 miles might be okay if you lived in Nebraska and there was never a hill around, but if you live in places where there are hills or there are mountains or there's a lot of traffic or not very much traffic or higher or lower speed limits, etc., then obviously your range and your mileage will vary, and that's what this display is telling us over here on the left. The Bolt certainly has a peppy feel to it, thanks to that large amount of torque and, of course, 200 horsepower from the electric motor. Zero to 60 in our testing took just 6.2 seconds, making this one of the quicker mainstream EVs that you can get. In our 60 to zero braking test, it took 133 feet for this vehicle to stop from 60 miles an hour back to zero. That's definitely long for a subcompact hatchback. That's because of the weight of the Bolt. The battery pack is definitely heavy. It weighs nearly a thousand pounds, just as we see in every other battery electric vehicle out there. And we have relatively narrow tires in an attempt to improve efficiency. The tires on this Bolt are 215 width tires, and that also plays into our handling score, which I'm gonna give a B minus. Remember that there is a really odd competitive set when we're talking about any electric vehicle out there, especially an electric vehicle with a price tag of about $40,000. So there are obviously some luxury, some near luxury EVs that you could compare this to, and a ton of other plug-in hybrids out there as well that you might wanna be cross shopping. And in that world, there are definitely gonna be options that are gonna handle better than the Bolt. But that doesn't mean that the Bolt handles poorly. In fact, it handles pretty well because of the low center of gravity. The battery pack being completely under the floor and being in that skateboard fashion gives this a much better weight balance than you generally find in a front wheel drive hatchback in the US and better handling than you might think for a vehicle with tires this size. These are also very eco-focused tires. In some ways, the Bolt kind of reminds me of an electric GTI, I guess you could say. In acceleration, we don't get much tip. In braking, we don't get much dive. And there's really very little body roll going on in the Bolt, period. That's because of that low position of the battery. We also get a reasonable amount of thrust. 6.2 seconds, zero to 60 is pretty peppy for a front wheel drive vehicle. And this is probably all the power that we could really deliver to the front wheels without having an awful lot of torque steer, which is very well controlled in the Bolt. When it comes to the ride score, the Bolt is competing in really a weird segment because there are so many different EVs that you might want to 
compare the Bolt 2 based on price and the fact that they're full EVs. And that leads to some strange comparisons. Comparisons of this to a Model 3, to a Model Y, to a Nero, to a Soul, to the perhaps even a Polestar or plug-in hybrids out there. I suppose you could make those comparisons as well. Something uh, even like a Toyota RAV4 Prime. I've received a number of questions about that lately. And in that enormously large comparative set, the Bolt's ride quality is not going to be as good as something like the RAV4 plug-in hybrid or obviously luxury hybrids or EVs out there like the Tesla Model 3, Model Y, etc. So I'm going to give this a C plus when it comes to the ride quality. Remember that the Bolt is relatively narrow. It's also relatively short. And that means that the suspension is interacting with the road in a way that's relatively similar to something like the Mini Electric. There's not as much time for the front suspension to settle by the time the rear suspension impacts a bump as you'd have in a bigger vehicle with a bigger wheelbase. In our cabin noise test, we got 72 and a half decibels in here. That's pretty similar to a lot of other entry-level subcompact vehicles. But remember, the majority of them are going to cost less than half of this. So if we're talking about something like a Nissan Versa or a Nissan Kick, something along those lines, those are going to be less expensive and about the same kind of cabin noise. In our usual range test, the Bolt scored a little bit better than it did in the past. This particular model came in with a real-world Allison Auto score of 247 miles. That's not too far off the 259 that the EPA says this is rated for. And it was definitely right in the range that was being displayed over here on the driver's instrument cluster. Again, I really love the way that GM has done that. Right now, for instance, it's telling us that its range estimate is 154 miles, minimum 126, maximum 181. It was pretty spot on as far as our range went when we did our range test. As far as EV efficiency goes, the Bolt is pretty decent, so I'm going to go ahead and give this an A. But again, keep in mind we do have relatively narrow tires. And when it comes to efficiency, I'm simply talking about how many miles can you get out of a kilowatt hour. If you're very gentle, there are a few Tesla models that will be a little bit more efficient than this, but not every Tesla in real-world driving gets quite what the EPA says you should. For instance, our recent test of the Model Y, it fell notably below the Model 3. Now, that's totally expected because the Model Y is bigger, it's heavier, it's longer than the Model 3. So I didn't really expect it to really match the Model 3's range numbers like Tesla was claiming, but the Tesla 3 is pretty close to its overall estimates. And depending on the version of the Model 3 you get, you will certainly find models that are a little bit more efficient than the Bolt. Tesla really has an eye on efficiency and they're willing to change up motors and things like that midway through product life cycles to try and deliver maximum efficiency to their product line. And we haven't seen too much of a change in the Bolt as far as its drivetrain. We get the updated battery for 2020, but no real motor changes under the hood. Bottom lining, the Bolt is pretty easy. This has a slightly more cohesive feel to it out on the road than something like the Nero or the Kona EV. The Kona feels a little bit tall, but the Kona also, on the other hand, feels a little bit more modern inside. And sometimes it can feel a little bit more fun because Hyundai has not controlled the torque quite as well as GM does. For instance, if I come to a complete stop here and uh, we just floor it, we don't really get any drama. GM has limited traction at the lower speeds, that way they don't overwhelm the front tires. And for some reason, Hyundai decided not to do that in the Kona. If you have it in the sport mode and traction control is off, you can get a little bit of one wheel peel, which is hilarious. It's not going to make you go any faster, zero to 60, but still a little bit more fun. Chevy, I think, also does a good job when it comes to the tuning of the regen brake system. The regen brakes in this vehicle are very smooth. They feel much more natural as far as transitions between regen and friction braking than, for instance, Toyota's hybrid line, even today. We also have a few different ways of controlling the regen. We can put the drivetrain in the low mode here. That gives us much more aggressive regen than we find in the drive mode. And then we have the paddle right back here on the back of the steering wheel. If we use the paddle on the back of the steering wheel, it will take us to a complete stop pretty quickly here, as you can see. And then it will actually hold us here. That gives us a little bit more adjustability than some EVs out there, but I do wish that we had more of a up-down regen paddle on the back of the steering wheel where you could adjust things and include a true sailing mode where there was no regen at all. Because in a lot of situations, especially out on the open highway, no regen at all is going to be a little bit more efficient than having some sort of regen that automatically kicks in. The most important things to know about the Bolt for 2020 are that General Motors has not adjusted the price after they've lost their EV tax credits. That is important to keep in mind. So it's still going to start at $36,620. Although there does seem to be a decent amount of cash on the hood when you go to the dealer. So dealer discounts are pretty steep and there are some additional manufacturer incentives, but they really haven't adjusted the MSRP. First, let's talk about what I think is the closest competitor to the Bolt, the Hyundai Kona. Range is almost identical between these two models, 259 miles in the Bolt, 258 miles in the Kona. Now the Kona's 
trying to be a little bit more of a crossover because there is, of course, a gasoline version of the Kona that is available with all-wheel drive. But when we're talking about the EV, it's front-wheel drive only, very much like the Bolt. The styling of these two models reminds me a little bit of one another when you take a look at them from the side. Obviously, the Kona looks different up front and in the back, but they're the same shape of vehicle. They're sort of a lifted hatchback shape. And both of these options are clearly on the smaller side of things. Obviously, something like a Toyota Camry is going to be an awful lot larger. The Kona is priced pretty similarly at $37,190, but it still qualifies for its full federal tax incentives. That means that generally speaking, if you qualified for all of those incentives, the Kona is going to be less expensive, notably so. As with the Chevy Bolt, the Kona is a little bit small on the inside, but I have to say that I do prefer the Kona over the Bolt. I found the front seats to be an awful lot more comfortable. I also found the infotainment system to be a little bit more modern feeling. Now, I love the size of the infotainment screen that we find in the Bolt, but a lot of the rest of the electronics just aren't where we see some of the competition. The next closest competitor has to be the Kia Niro. The Niro and the Kona use the same drivetrain, but the vehicles themselves are actually not that closely related. The Niro is more closely related to the Hyundai Ioniq rather than the Kona. Although the Niro isn't exactly a large vehicle, you will notice the size difference between it and the Kona EV. It's going to feel a little bit larger, a little bit wider on the inside. But like the Kona, remember that the Niro is not going to be available in all 50 states. So depending on where you live, the Bolt might be the best option. The Niro is a little bit more expensive than the Kona because we find a little bit more equipment in the Kia version. It's going to be $39,990 and like the Hyundai, still qualifies for its full federal tax credit. The Niro got a recent refresh in North America. It hadn't been on sale for that long, but they decided to tweak the front end look and tweak the interior to give it their latest infotainment systems. As a result, it certainly feels more modern than the Bolt as well. On the downside, range is a little bit shorter at 239 miles, but like the Hyundai Kona, a heat pump system is available in the Niro, and it really isn't going to make a big difference in terms of range in the winter. The Bolt certainly made a splash when it launched for being one of the least expensive long-range EVs available in America. But what if you're not looking for something that has a range that long? What if you're looking for something as a daily commuter? Well, that's where the new Mini EV slots in. It's the Mini Cooper SE. The Mini is an interesting option because I do love the way that it looks. The Mini is very distinctive. It's also fun to drive. It handles well, but the range isn't where we see the Bolt. It's just 110 miles, so less than half of what we find in the Chevy Bolt but it is a lot less expensive. It starts at $29,900 and qualifies for the full set of rebates, which for a lot of folks out there will drop the price down to about $20,000, significantly less expensive than the $36,620 of the Chevy Bolt. But of course, remember that there are gonna be additional discounts on the Bolt, so it's gonna drop that range down a little bit. The Mini feels a little bit more modern than the Bolt in some ways. We do have a faster onboard AC charger, and it also feels a little bit more premium. But the true elephant in the room has to be the Tesla Model 3. For $37,990, the Model 3 is only $1,000 more than the Chevy Bolt. And it's going to have a range pretty similar, 250 miles. It's going to be significantly faster than the Bolt at 5.3 seconds, 0 to 60. Now, the Model 3 isn't a hatchback, but it is very cargo practical. It has a big trunk, a big back seat, much more comfortable seats all the way around than the Bolt. It's going to feel much more modern, and it's going to have the frunk in the front. In my mind, because the Chevy Bolt has lost its EV tax credits and because of its price tag, I think that the Model 3 really is a pretty tough competitor here. And if I were shopping for an EV in this segment and I didn't want to go down to something like the Mini EV, which I think is a really great option, or the Hyundai Ioniq EV, also a great option for city EVs, ranges about 150 to 100 miles in, in that range right there, then I would probably just get a Model 3. $37,990, again, is only $1,000 more than the Chevy Bolt. Yes, you will get some better deals on the Bolt on the Chevy dealer lot, but that really depends on where you are. Sometimes it could be three to $4,000 only. Sometimes it could be a little bit steeper than that. But unless you're really getting five to $6,000 or more off of the Bolt's MSRP, I think the Tesla Model 3 is just going to be a better buy. But on the other hand, if you're looking for an inexpensive commuter EV, which I think a lot of folks that were shopping for the Bolt initially were looking for, then I think that the Mini EV is an excellent option, as is the refreshed Hyundai Ioniq EV. It got a refresh and a bigger battery for 2020. It didn't get any extra power. It's still going to be much slower than the Model 3, but I think it's still a great option in this segment, and it's going to be a lot less expensive. But again, if you're talking about an EV that's right here around the $37,000 range, I would probably just end up getting the Tesla Model 3. Let me know what you think about that down there in the comment section below. What would you pick if you were shopping in this segment? And would you even consider something like a city EV? Something like the mini EV that has a 110 mile range that's going to be suitable for most folks out there to do their daily commuting in? Is that something that you're interested in? Or do you think that all EV manufacturers should really be focusing on longer range? 
Be sure to head over to facebook.com slash alexnados. Find us at Twitter, Instagram, all those social things. And of course, check out our merch. You can buy shirts right like this, that link down there at the bottom of your screen. I'll see all of you later.